Welcome to our lecture online. Now we're ready to find the moment of inertia of a volume distribution or a mass distribution. So in this case, we're going to take one eighth of a unit sphere, the portion that is in the positive x, y, and z direction. So it's one eighth of a full unit sphere. And let's say that the density is equal to one. What is the moment of inertia about the x-axis, and that's the one we're going to find when we're looking for i, x, x, the upper left diagonal element. And of course, we have to do that for all diagonal elements and for all off uh, diagonal elements. But because of the symmetry, notice that we should get the very same result as we rotate this, rotate this around the x-axis versus the y-axis versus the z-axis. So I'm assuming that whatever we find to be the moment of inertia element for ixx, we find the same value for iyy and for izz. All three diagonal elements should have the same value because of the symmetry. And it turns out that's indeed the case. So remember that we started out with the equation r squared minus x squared for the ixx component, even if we had a single point mass. And since r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared, the x squares would cancel out, and this ends up to be y squared plus z squared for a single unit element. But since we have now a mass distribution, and we're going to work with spherical coordinates, we should leave it as r squared minus x squared. And x can be written as r sine theta cosine phi. And since it's squared, of course, that becomes r squared sine squared of theta times the cosine square of phi. The volume element dv is indeed r squared sine of theta dr d theta d phi. And the uh, limits of integration is going to be for r 0 to 1, for theta 0 to pi over 2, and for phi 0 to pi over 2. That will give us the 1 8 of a volume of a sphere. Now the first thing we want to do is multiply this times this. So we end up with r to the fourth sine of theta minus r to the fourth sine cube of theta cosine square of phi and then dr d theta d phi. So we'll have to make three integrals. We'll first start with the integral over phi. So we're going to integrate over phi first. And when we do that, notice we don't have any phi's in here. And the cosine squared of phi can be written as one half times one plus the cosine of two phi. That makes it easier. And there's the elements dr d theta d phi. So here, when we integrate this, we get phi evaluated from 0 to pi over 2, which gives us a pi over 2. Here, we don't have a phi either, so that's simply, again, times phi, which becomes pi over 2 when we plug in the elements. I mean, the, the limits, not the elements, but the limits. And then here, when we integrate, notice that since we have the cosine of 2 phi, we need a 2 d phi. That gives us 1 over 4. That's where the 1 over 4 comes from r to the fourth sine cube of theta doesn't change, but here we end up with the sine of 2 phi, and we're plugging the limit from 0 to pi over 2, that gives us sine of pi, because it was twice the angle, so sine of pi minus sine of 0. This will become equal to 0, so this whole term here goes to 0, and we're left with these two to integrate on our second integral. So now we're going to integrate over d theta, and on the first one here, the integral of the sine is the minus cosine. And the integral of the sine cube of theta, now that's a little bit more complicated, so that turns out it is one-third the cosine of theta times the quantity sine square of theta plus 2. And then we evaluate that from 0 to pi over 2. When we do that here, when we plug in the upper limit, we get 0. Lower limit, we get minus a minus 1, which is a plus 1. So we end up with pi over 2 times r to the fourth. So when I plug in the limits here, what do I get? When I plug in the upper limit, pi over 2, I get a 0 here. So when I plug in the upper limit, this whole thing goes to 0. When I plug in the lower limit, I get 1, 1 times 1 third. Here I get a 0, so I get 1 third times 2, or 2 thirds. And 2 thirds of 1 over 4 gives me 2 over 12. So when I come over here, I end up with 1 over 12 times a 2. The negative 1 here makes sense because I'm subtracting the lower limit, so the cosine of 0 is 1, but I'm subtracting get a negative 1, so that's where the negative comes from. And so now I'm ready to integrate the third integral over r. So we have a dr there. When we integrate, we get pi r to the fifth over 5, but 5 times 2 gives me 10. And over here in the denominator, now we had a 6, right? 2 divided by 12 is 1 over 6. So we have pi over 6, but when we integrate, r to the fourth, we get r to the fifth over 5. 5 times 6 is 30. 
So now we have pi over 10, because when we plug in the upper limit, we get 1 for r. The lower limit, we get 0, so we can drop that. So we get pi over 10 minus pi over 30. Factor out of pi, we get 3 over 30 minus 1 over 30. We get 2 over 30 times pi, or pi over 15, which is the result we get for the moment of inertia about the x-axis. And as we indicated, we should get the same result for the y-axis and the z-axis. So all three diagonal terms of the inertia tensor should indeed give us pi over 15. At least that takes care of the diagonal terms. Now we need to find the moment of inertia elements in the inertia tensor for the off-diagonal elements. And of course for that, we're going to have to do another video because I'm out of board space. So stay tuned and we'll show you how to do the second part of this problem, looking for the off-diagonal elements using a similar technique. And that's how it's done.